we we asked the question exactly who are we worshiping and we took our first look at who god is from job chapter 38 uh, we saw God continue to ask Job question after question, uh, the purpose of which really is to reveal who God is. We saw that God, it was God who created the earth. It was God who set the sea's boundaries, who created daylight and darkness, who has been to the depths of the ocean, who has seen the gates of death. So I have a question before we start. At some point last week, did you start to feel a little sorry for Job? <laughs> you know, if God would ask you and me those questions, how would we respond? We're not going to see Job's response for a little while. Uh, we know it's coming. We know the, the rest of the questions that God's going to ask him, and uh, of course he can't answer any of them. Last week, God asked Job a lot of questions about dealing with his creation. And this week, he's going to ask him questions about the specific creatures within his creation. And you've probably figured out by now that uh, Job's not going to be able to answer God. And you know what? Neither can we. Right about now, a large sense of humility ought to be developing in each one of us. And that sense of humility ought to deepen as we continue to expand our view of who God is. Oh, good work, because I can't see it back there anymore. Thank you. All right, let's open a prayer. Father, thank you for the reminder of who you are. Last week we spent some time looking at the questions you asked Job, and if people ask for themselves, um, we need to be a little bit more humble, understand exactly who you are. Uh, you the amazing creator of everything, and yet you're also the one who loves so deeply that you're willing to send your son to God for us and not have eternal life with you. And so this evening, as we take a look at your word again, we pray that your spirit would open our minds, open our hearts, our eyes, so we can see the truth that we find here as we learn a little bit more about who you are. We do ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So the next conversation we'll be looking at is God questioning Job regarding some of the animals found on the earth. Okay, we're going to start in the end of chapter 38 and then go on into chapter 39. Uh, there's going to be 12 of God's creatures described. All of these animals show the creative genius and the providential care of God for his creation. So God begins with the lion, the king of the beasts, and he ends with the eagle, who some believe uh, are, is the most majestic of birds. Job's lack of ability and knowledge will be seen in the fact that he could not provide food for the first two animals. He did not know when these animals give birth to their offspring. It wasn't Job who set them free or tamed them. He, didn't, uh, he did not give them uh, their peculiar looks or ways of living, nor did he provide them with their ability to fly or not fly. One might think that animals being lower than man in terms of their intelligence and reason could be controlled and cared for by man, but really it's God who takes care of all those creatures. Just as a quick reminder, Psalm 50 verse 10 reminds us that the cattle on a thousand hills are mine, says the Lord. And they are, in fact, they're his creatures. Isaiah 42 tells us, Thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, and who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk in it. And then finally, in Ezekiel 18.4, God says, Behold, all souls are mine. All right, let's take a look, starting in chapter 38, verse 39. The first questions are going to come regarding lions and ravens. Verse 39, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lion when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in their lair? Who prepares for the raven its nourishment when its young cry out to, what's your Bible say right there? God. God. And wander about without food. So, let's use a little bit of common sense here. Would you or I normally 
under any circumstances, go into the wild and try to feed the lions. Um, not unless we want to be in a meal. Of course, not. we would never do that. Yet that's exactly what God does. He provides food for his lions. Job, for his own safety, and us as well, we would steer clear of lions. Uh, we would not try to feed them neither to Job. But remember, it's by God's design that some of his creatures end up as food for others of his creatures. And Job had nothing to do with that design. And he didn't leave. Verse 41, well, Job, if you can't provide food for the lions, how about for some of the birds? Nope. Job couldn't provide food for the black ravens, whose young are often forgotten by their parents. Job is not the nourisher or provider of all the earth's kingdoms. God is. So, what comfort is there in this for us? Since God cares for even the sparrow, which is of lesser value than humans, would God neglect to care for his people? The ones whom he redeemed through the blood of his own son? Of course not. He has promised to meet the needs of his people. Maybe not the wants, but the needs. And we can trust him. We can act on that. That's a promise. We can trust it more and more. Well, the second thing God's going to talk about are the goats and the deer. In the next four verses, God God shows Job what little understanding he had. But the untamed creatures that run wild in the desert they are completely cared for by God's providential hand. Look at verse, chapter 39, verse 1. Do you know the time the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you count the months they fulfill, or do you know the time they give birth? They kneel down, they bring forth their young. They get rid of their labor pains. Their offspring become strong. They grow up in the open field. They leave and do not return to them. You see, Job did not know when animals give birth to their young, nor did he know how long these creatures carried their young before even giving birth. Completely apart from man's help, or knowledge, for that matter. But under God's supervision, the mountain goats and deer bring forth their young. Who soon grow up, they leave their parents, and fend to themselves, just as God had designed. This particular mountain goat here that's mentioned, it may be the goat that's called the Nubian Ibex. It's a goat in the wilds of the Middle East, that actually hides when it bears its young. Even today, relatively few people have ever seen these goats when they're giving birth. But God has. God describes the birthing process. Look at verse 3. They kneel down. They bring forth their young. They get rid of their later parents. And then in verse 4, God describes the growing up process and the fact that when they're grown, they don't return to their parents. Their offspring become strong. They grow up in the open field, and they leave and do not return to them. Again, this is all by God's design. You see, nothing happens outside of God's sovereign design and purpose. That's the God of Scripture. Thirdly now, we're going to talk about the wild donkeys. This is chapter 39, 5 through 8. So, The wild donkey is a creature we frequently read about in Scripture. It's said to be untamable. Verse 5. Who set out the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I gave the wilderness for its home and the salt land for his dwelling place? He scorns the tumult of the city. The shoutings of the driver he does not hear. He explores the mountains for his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. It was God who released the wild donkeys out into the desert where they roamed. This is a wasteland. Where they lived in the, um, near the salt flats, perhaps around the Dead Sea, these donkeys reject the noise and the civilization. They wanted to roam the hills of the Middle East. It was God who set these creatures free. Notice verse 6. To whom I 
gave the wilderness for a home, and the salt land for his dwelling place. Job, I gave the donkey its home. I set it free. I'm the one who gave him all the wilderness for his home. He doesn't like the city. The hustle and bustle of crowds or shouting of the driver trying to herd the rest of the animals. No, Job, he explores and wanders through all the open pasture land that I gave him. He finds food where I have provided for him. And only God can help these animals survive in the wilderness and the salt man around the Dead Sea. This is beyond Job's ability, and it's beyond any human's ability. So another question for you. Is your view of God beginning to expand yet? I hope so. Let's continue. For fourth, we're going to talk about the wild oxen. Verse 9. Will the wild ox consent to serve you, Job? Or will he spend the night in your manger? Can you bind the wild ox in a furrow with ropes? Or will he harrow, that means to plow? Will he plow the valleys after you? Will you trust him because his strength is great and leave your labor to him? Will you have faith in him that he will return your grain? And gather it from the from your threshing floor. So here, in contrast, with setting the wild donkey free, Job could not tame the wild ox. By the way, have any of you ever seen either a picture of or a close and personal with a wild ox? They're huge. They're huge. Powerful, strong creatures. This particular wild ox resisted domestication. It wasn't going to serve Job. It's not going to spend the night in his barn. Not like a domesticated cow. And it's not going to submit to be tied to a plow. To, to plow the fields for him. Incredibly strong, but it's not going to do any heavy work. Nor is it going to pull a cart with grain from the field all the way to the threshing floor. So if Job couldn't tame this wild animal, how could he hope to challenge God's ways with man? You see, the argument here is from the lesser to the greater. Job, if you can't even control this ox, one of God's creatures, how is it that you think you have the right to question the creator of everything you see? Do we do that? Do we, the created, have any right to question the creator? And yet, if we're honest with ourselves, we do. So as your view of God expands, you're going, you will understand more and more that He is God. We are not. He is God and He is sovereign. He is God, and though we don't understand what's happening in our lives sometimes, our question should not be, why is this happening to me? Maybe our question should be, what now, God? What do you want me to learn from this situation? What do you want me to do for your honor and your glory now that this has happened in my life? I don't understand it, but I trust you. Show me what I need to do now. I need your hands. I think that's the proper heart attitude. Look at verse 13. The fifth creature is the ostrich. This ostrich is a wonderful animal. It's a very large bird, but it never flies. God describes it next. The ostrich's wings flap joyously with the pinion and plumage of love, for she abandons her eggs to the earth and warms them in the dust. And she forgets that a foot may crush them, or that a wild beast may trample them. She treats her young cruelly, as if they were not hers. Though her labor be in vain, she's unconcerned. Okay. 
I ask, why is she unconcerned? Look at verse 17. Notice, because God has made her forget wisdom and has not given her a share of understanding. When she lifts herself up on high, in other words, when she stands up tall, she laughs at the horse in his rider. While the ostrich is a wonderful animal, it's a really strange bird and it's got some really odd features. Fully grown, they weigh up to 300 pounds and reach a height of seven or eight feet. Ostrich can flap its wings all it wants to, but it can't fly. And unlike birds that fly, an ostrich lays its eggs in a nest on the ground, not in a tree. In fact, several ostriches, may, hens, may lay their eggs in one nest. But if there's no more room in the nest, they drop their eggs outside the nest, on the ground. Other hens, in the confusion of getting in and out of the nest, may actually step on and crush the egg. The ostriches apparent disregard for or even cruel treatment of their young shows their lack of wisdom and good sense just like verse 17 tells us notice because God made her forget wisdom and has not given her a share of understanding God you say God is just kind of dumb kind of stupid but that's exactly how God created her. He created the ostrich without a lot of smarts. He made her forget wisdom. He's withheld her share of understanding. The ostrich is clearly not the brightest bulb in the land. The hens may desert the nest if they're overfed or if they get impatient. They may leave the nest before all the chicks are hatched. If a human disturbs the nest, they may just trample the eggs. Or a hen might go and sit on a different nest, forgetting all about her own eggs. And in spite of all that God given ignorance, an ostrich can run at 40 miles per hour. That's pretty quick. That might even be faster than some horses. I'm not a horse person. Do I know the answer to that? Do horses run that fast? Nobody knows. Okay. Well, so would Job even think of making such a peculiar bird, let alone be able to create from nothing, which is what God did. He created from nothing. Well, next, God's going to talk about something called the war horse. There's a lot of horses and a lot of horse lovers here in Northwest Arkansas. Listen to how God describes the war horse that he created. As he continues to add to a more building stuff. Hey Job, do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like a locust? His majestic snorting is terrible. He paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He goes out to meet the weapons. He laughs with fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him, the flashing spear and the javelin. With shaking and rage, he races over the ground, and he does not stand still at the voice of the trumpet. In other words, he doesn't freeze up. There's no panic in this horse. As often as the trumpet sounds, he says, Aha! And he scents the battle from afar, and thunder of the captain and the war cry. Once again, Job has nothing to do with creating these horses. With their strength and their flowing mane, its ability to leap like a locust while snorting and pawing and eagerly and fearlessly entering a battle. Those characteristics were all given to it by God. With the rider's weapons on its side, the war horse Prances on the ground as if eating it up while waiting for the trumpet. The signal, the charge into battle. He is not afraid. Snorting, he smells the scent of battle from a distance and he hears the battle command. 
the descriptive words used here in these verses matches the war horse's life, its strength, and its courage in battle. And since Job was not the one to give strength to this horse, he had no right to question the horse's creator. Well, lastly, God's going to talk about the hawks and the eagle. So far we've seen that Job, nor any other human being, had anything to do with the lion, the raven, the goat, the deer, the donkey, the oxen, the ostrich, or the war, war horses. Well, maybe Job could answer questions about some of the birds. Look at verse 26. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching its wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the cliff he dwells and lodges, upon the rocky crag, an inaccessible place. From there he spies out food, his eyes see it from afar. His young ones also suck up blood, and where they, when where the slain are, there he is. Amazing description of the eagles as we know them today, and the hawks, both. Uh, I believe there's some eagle nests around here somewhere, right? Further out, further east of here. Um, it's amazing when you see where they where they put their nests, they're really high, they're tucked up into these crags in the mountains, it's really hard to even see them. That's exactly what God says to do. Amazing. Also talks about the annual migration of the hawk toward the south. That occur, occurs apart from Job's help or wisdom. And what about the eagle? Maybe Job had something to do with teaching it how to build that nest. No. The eagle soars, the hawk soars, builds its nest at high altitude, on a cliff or a rocky crag where its keen vision allows it to spy out food in the distance. This view of a few of the world's creatures demonstrates that Job and all mankind are unable to contend with God's creation. And therefore, we are hardly qualified to answer the question or condemn the Creator. At the same time, these words show God's delight. He delights in His creation. His angels sang and shouted for joy. When he made the earth and, and his animals, the world, all of various diversity. God also uses his creation to limit the wicked. To help man, to water the earth, all those things. He controls and he limits creation. He regulates creation. He sustains creation. Including all of us. Our very next heartbeat. Is because God allowed the town. In the animal world, God provides for his creatures. He feeds them. He helps them. He frees them. He strengthens them. In contrast, Job, who is a representative of all mankind, could do none of these things. We can't. Obviously, God. Order of creation is provided for and well cared for by its creator. Earlier in the book, Job questioned God's watch care over his creation. It seemed arbitrary and random to Job. To Job, it looked like God lacked control, provision, and care for his creatures. From Job's perspective, especially for Job himself, he'd lost his children, he'd lost his animals, he'd lost his servants. He's sitting on the ground covered with ashes, scraping his boils with a broken piece of pottery to find some sort of relief from the satanic attack. Don't miss the point of all of this. God is not wholly cruel. We know that. We know that at the end of this, he will restore Job double what he had before. He has a greater purpose, which Job hasn't realized just yet. 
you will see it again. But in the meantime, God is revealing to Job and to us more and more about who he really is. Sometimes when things happen to us, we don't understand it until later. Then we find out what the purpose is. What God's plan was all along. This had to happen in order for this to happen. It is my hope that each one of us will continue to expand our view of who God really is. So that our worship of God, the God of the Scriptures, will be true from the heart. That our worship will not be seen as what kind of music we sing or play, or that worship will not be about our personal preferences, that our worship will be gladly given from the heart, from the core of who we are. And that that worship will be in both spirit and truth. Spiritual, in the sense that God has rebirthed the spirit of the true believer in Jesus Christ. And truthful, in the sense that our worship is in line with what the scripture says worship ought to be. When we see God for who he really is, as opposed to what he can do for us, then it won't matter about our preferences. We can sit in our house. We can sit in our yard. We can stand on top of a mountain. We can stare out of the vastness of the ocean. Or we can sit here on Sunday evening and really worship God in Scripture for who he is really. Is your view of God getting a little bigger? Are you seeing him in a different light? Are you starting to have a sense of awe and amazement as you learn more about him? Also, let me close with a quote from Ron Owens. The God we worship is the one who has absolute authority and complete sovereignty over all things. Nothing ever happens that's beyond his control. In fact, Jesus said that not even a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. I believe many believers do not really grasp the importance of this reality. Imagine how different things would be if we lived our lives consistently with this view in mind. What a difference it would make in our reaction to life if we were to keep sight of the throne of God when we face the unexpected or when tragedy struck. The actions and attitudes of Christians would be radically different from those of unbelievers. Their lives would truly bear witness of their faith in Christ as it should. Father, thank you again for a glimpse of who you really are. We are it's time to understand. Forgive us for the time when we are arrogant. We can be prideful people. Sometimes we think we know it all, we know more than you do. And that's just not right. Help us to walk with love and humility and an awareness of who you really are. God who created everything out of nothing spoke and the worlds came into being. The universe, the animals, the trees, the forests, the mountains, all of it. And yet, even in the midst of all that power, you have a deep love for your creation, especially for humanity. A love that was willing Pay the ultimate price. To send the Lord Jesus from the glories of heaven. To be born as a human being. To live life as we live life. Yet without sin. He is our redeemer. He is 
the one and only. We thank you for that. Be with us this week as we walk. Help us to remember what we learned. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.